relax, sit down. Just pick your feet up and breathe. Come on and smile. Don't frown. Don't get in an uproar and leave. Now I don't mean to analyze you like some knockoff Sigmund Freud. They may be out to get you, but don't get so paranoid. Come on, relax. Sit down and have another drink on me. Hello out there in podcast land, and welcome to Dead Kitchen Radio, the Keith R. A. DeCandido podcast. I remain, as always, Keith R. A. DeCandido. Uh, way back in 2010, I was approached by Dark Quest Books about publishing Unicorn Precinct. I published my first original novel, Dragon Precinct, back in 2004 from Simon & Schuster, but the imprint it was a part of was discontinued. Uh, so the series was kind of left flapping in the breeze until uh, Neil Levin, the publisher of Dark Quest, came to me and said, hey, want to do Unicorn Precinct with us? Uh, I did that. The book came out in 2011. I uh, also got the rights back to Dragon Precinct, and uh, Dark Quest reprinted it also in 2011. Uh, between 2012 and 2013, two more uh, Precinct books, three more book, Precinct books came out. Uh, Goblin Precinct, Griffin Precinct, and uh, the short story collection Tales from Dragon Precinct. Eventually, Dark Quest will also publish Mermaid Precinct, which I just gotta write it, hopefully this year. And um, meanwhile, in 2013, uh, Neil approached me about doing a collection of my short fiction, uh, an idea I really liked. Uh, I've been wanting. I'd, I'd had enough short fiction, I thought, to, to put a, a proper collection together, and I really wanted there to be one, especially for some of the more obscure stories that were hard to find. So I started pulling together short fiction from throughout the years, uh, and the book uh, was finally published in 2015, complete with a superb cover by Angela McKendrick, which uh, not only can be seen on the cover of the book, but is also uh, used as part of the background image for the new Dead Kitchen Radio logo that I've been using since I rebooted the podcast this year. Putting... The collection together presented a couple challenges. Neil was rather shocked when I gave him a manuscript with only 11 titles, as he was under the impression that I had written close to 100 short stories, which I have. The issue was twofold. One was, there's about a dozen Dragon Precinct stories, in the same setting as the books I mentioned before. These are police procedurals taking place in the high fantasy setting of the city-state of Cliff's End, and there are about another dozen stories featuring Cassie Zukov, a weirdness magnet, which, uh, these are urban fantasy stories taking place in Key West, Florida. I really can only do one story from each of those two milieus, so that wiped out a bunch of stories right there. Um, more on those two in a minute. The other problem was that the vast majority of my short fiction has been media tie-in work. I don't control the rights to my Star Trek, Farscape, Doctor Who, Zorro, Xena, Magic the Gathering, Battletech, Marvel Comics, or Stargate SG-1 stories, so I couldn't include any of them. It is for that reason that, with some help from my friends Christopher L. Bennett and Electra Hammond, I wound up titling the collection Without a License, subtitled The Fantastic Worlds of Keith R.A. DeCandido. Um, even leaving out the license stuff, though, I still had enough to fill a book even if it was only 11 stories. Uh, two of them were shared world, rather than media tie-ins, but it was easy enough to send email to Steve Saville and Jonathan Mayberry and get permission to reprint 30 and The Ballad of Big Charlie, which were part of the viral and viewers milieus, respectively. In addition, I had a silly story about animals that was in a 2007 anthology called Furry Fantastic, a fun little dialogue-only story aptly titled A Vampire and a Vampire Hunter Walk into a Bar, which first appeared in Amazing Stories back in 2005 and has actually been reprinted twice since. Uh, a murder mystery that was published in an online zine from the 90s and later uh, reprinted in an early 2000s uh, short story collection. Um, and then there were two other stories which are in worlds that I intend to write more of. One more immediate than the other. Uh, Under the King's Bridge was first published in the 2011 anthology Liar Liar, and it's the first story featuring Brom Gold, a nice Jewish boy from the Bronx who hunts monsters. Brom's first novel, A Furnace Sealed, will be out from Wordfire Press later this year, uh, and this story works as a nice little preview to that upcoming novel series. I also wrote The Stone of the First High Pontiff for the Defending the Future anthology series, uh, which features Jin, the human finder, which is another character I intend to do more with in the future. No immediate plans for, for more with the Human Finder at the moment, but um, um, there's there's a novel notion floating around in there, and possibly more short stories, and we'll see what happens. In addition to all those, I uh, had two previously unpublished stories. 
One was a story I wrote as part of a three beers and a story competition at the World Science Fiction Convention in Boston in 2004. Uh, the other one was a story I wrote for an anthology that never actually got published. More on that in a minute, too. Finally, I wanted to have, like I said, one story each representing Dragon Precinct and Cassie Zukov. At first, I was going to pick a story from each to reprint. Then I thought, no, let's do an original precinct story for the collection. It'll add value, especially since it was coming out from the same publisher as the precinct books. And then I went through the Cassie stories, and I couldn't think of find a good one that I thought would be a good one to reprint. Um, the the ones I thought would be best for or ones that had already been reprinted. Uh, and eventually, I decided to hell with it and just wound up writing an original Cassie story as well. For the former, I wrote a story that focused on Danthrus Tresillian and Aletha Lothlothna. The latter is a character I created for another precinct short story, Catch and Release, which, by the way, I think is one of the best of the short stories taking place in Cliff's End. Um, Alita was only meant to be a one-off, but she kind of snuck her way into another story and then wound up playing a big role in Griffin Precinct, and now she's one of the major supporting characters. Go fig. She and Danthers have a very tempestuous relationship, uh, and so I wrote Partners in Crime to highlight that. As for Cassie, her story was called Seven Mile Race. The Cassie stories already had several figures from Norse mythology as supporting characters, Odin, Loki, Sigyn, Gerard, and Thor, and this tale added Tyr, Eitri, and Broker to the mix, as we get the sibling rivalry between Thor and Tyr, the real story of how Thor's hammer was forged, and a race on the Seven Mile Bridge in the Florida Keys. That's one of the stories I'm going to read on this episode of Dead Kitchen Radio uh, from Without a License. The other one I'm going to read is the one that I sold to an anthology that never got published. I'll have more on that after I read for you Seven Mile Race. A Tale of Cassie Zukov, Weirdness Magnet. I knew trouble was coming when I walked into Mayor Fred's saloon on a Saturday night, and Thor was in the bar. Having the Thunder God back in Key West was just the perfect capper to this shitty week. With the ramp up to the Daytona 500, it was the beginning of spring tourist season on the island. This was great for the Botroff House bed and breakfast on Eaton Street, where I lived and worked, and the Sea Clips dive shop over on Stock Island, where I just worked. It wasn't so hot in terms of keeping me from getting homicidal. From December to February, the tourists were mostly casual, just folks coming down to get away from the cold weather farther north. But Daytona signaled the beginning of the silly season. It also included Bike Week in early March, and the great horror that is spring break right after that. That was when all the crazies showed up. And nobody was crazier than Thor, one of several Norse deities in my life. About six foot ten, with shoulders the size of Ohio, Thor had a red crew cut and a thick red beard that make him, made him look like half the bears on the island, except for the fact that he wasn't gay. I hadn't seen him since New Year's. I really hoped he wasn't going to hit on me again. Or hit on anyone else. Or hit anything else. Of course, he saw me as soon as I came in. The house band, 1812, was tuning up for their set, and Thor was sitting at the table by the big ficus tree that Mayor Fred's was built around. My usual table. To be fair, the Easter had an affinity for the ficus. That was Key West's hanging tree in the 19th century, but the tourist websites won't tell you that it's also a root of Yggdrasil, the world tree that links the nine worlds together. Ah! Fair and lovely Dees, he bellowed. It is good to see you again! I closed my eyes and sighed. I supposed it was too much to ask that he'd finally pay attention and start calling me Cassie, like I'd asked him about a billion times. Come and join me, and we will toast to our lost comrades! There was no way to gracefully refuse, though I was tempted to gracelessly do so. Last April, I discovered that A, the Norse gods were real, B, there weren't that many of them left, and C, I sort of kind of was one. A fate goddess, one of the Deesir. Since then, I'd saved the world from Ragnarok and seen two of those gods die. A toast to their memory probably wouldn't be too terribly bad. As I sat in the chair next to him around the small round table... I shook my head. I'm surprised to see you, Thor. As I recall, you swore after what happened at the Red Garter over New Year's that you'd never set foot on this island again. Thor waved an arm. "'Twas but a trifle. The owner was a varlet and a knave. That lady was mine by right of conquest, and besides, I only broke one of those bouncer's arms. 
Adina came by before I could comment. Your usual, Cass? I nodded and Thor downed the half pint he'd had in front of him. And another for me, sweet Adina. She chuckled. You betcha. Thor watched her ass wiggle as she walked toward the bar. I just shook my head. Adina was a lesbian, which Thor already knew from the last four times he offered her the gift of his sexual favors. To be fair, he was incredibly drunk three of those times. So what brings you back? I asked by way of taking his attention off of Adina's posterior. Tomorrow is the Daytona 500, and I wish to observe the festivities in a convivial atmosphere. I nodded. Thor drove a muscle car, so of course he was into the race. My car nut days were behind me, and these days Daytona was just another event that brought the crazy to the island. Besides, Thor continued, if my brother loses, I am in a fine place to celebrate. And should he win, this is the ideal locale to drown my sorrows. I shot Thor a look. He told me once that Tyr was one of the gods who still lived, and he was also Thor's brother. Tyr is in the race? Well, he uses the name Janie McIntyre for reasons known only to himself, but yes. My eyes widened. That pretentious asshole who always wears his driving gloves is really Tyr? Indeed, that is he. Though he wears the gloves to cover the false hand that Itrian Broker fashioned for him. I recalled the story. After being told I was a deist, I devoured everything I could on Norse myth. Though the reality proved to only occasionally intersect with Snorri Sturluson. That was after Fenris bit his hand off, right? Thor nodded as Adina bought, brought our beers by. He raised the pint. To Odin, the Allfather! To Loki Laufeyson, my devious cousin! I raised my pint as well. Skull! I'd been there when both Odin and Loki had died, and it had been, well, very weird both times. I really hope that was the last time I'd have to deal with that. 1812, as usual, played a spectacular set of rock and roll cover tunes. It being Saturday night, the bar was packed, and the band stuck with well-known classics, including plenty of audience requests. It being Daytona weekend, there were lots of calls for Leonard Skinner, the Allman Brothers, Government Mule, ZZ Top, Molly Hatchet, and so on. Chet Smith, the bass player, had been bitching all week about how they were going to have to play all that redneck shit. After the second set ended, Thor turned to me. Beautiful Deese! Will you do me the honor of your company here on the morrow to watch my brother compete and, if the Norns are kind, lose horribly? I knew Ehor, the bartender, would be placing the big projector screen in front of the stage tomorrow and playing the race on it. Normally, I would have refused on principle, as I hadn't watched a race in years. And the last time I agreed to do something with Thor, it ended spectacularly badly. But knowing that Tyr would be one of the competitors, I was curious. The owners of C-Clips were race car nerds. The Daytona was considered a holiday, and the dive shop was always closed on that day. So I didn't have my usual Sunday afternoon dive. Sure, as long as you understand that we're staying right here in the bar. Under no circumstances am I accompanying you back to Summerland Key. Thor sighed and shrugged. This is your loss, superlative Dees. Do you keep a thesaurus around for new adjectives to use to describe me? He grinned. Not at all. I simply find your beauty inspiring. I had to admit, he displayed a certain charm. But I also had a first-hand report from one of his conquests that he wasn't exactly a master of the bedroom, no matter what he claimed. I came to Mayor Fred's the next day, where Thor, again, waited at the table by the ficus. There was a big crowd of racing enthusiasts, plus a few tourists and regulars like me. As well as Larry, an immortal who'd been sitting at this particular bar since the day it opened. To Thor's great disappointment, Jamie McIntyre won. In his post-race interview, he spouted all the usual clichés, most of which I tuned out, but I did see the two members of his pit crew standing proudly behind him. They were both very short, with huge noses. I also, he drawled with a southern accent that was way too exaggerated, want to thank my boys in the old pit crew, the Evaldi brothers. I couldn't have done none of this without them two fellers. Surprised, I turned to stare at Thor. The Evaldi brothers? His pit crew is Itrian Broker, aren't they? Of course, Thor said, as if it were the most natural thing in the world. Thor drank a great deal after the race, and tried to talk me into going home with him to his bungalow in Summerland Key, attempting to entice me by waggling his eyebrows and saying, again, that his hammer gets bigger if you rub it. I politely declined the first time, and rudely declined the second time. I held a knee to the nuts in reserve for the third, but that sadly never came. 
I thought he'd found some other woman to set his sights on right up until some tourist screamed that he found a body under the pool table. That body turned out to be Thor, very passed out. We left him there until closing, and then Ehor, Chet, and I all half-rolled, half-carried his sorry ass out to the sidewalk. Sure enough, his car was idling at the curb, waiting for him. Thor had a 1964 Pontiac GTO, nicknamed a goat, fitting for a guy who used to fly around in a chariot pulled by goats. Somehow the car always knew when Thor was passed out drunk, which was fairly often, and just showed up for him and took him home. Once we poured him into the front seat, the car zoomed off down Green Street. The next few days were incredibly busy, as the island was flooded with tourists in the aftermath of the race. Seaclips was booming, the bed and breakfast was full, I had to actually give up my room and sleep on the sofa in the lobby for two nights, and I didn't have a chance to get back to Mayor Fred's until Thursday afternoon. It was raining and windy, the water choppy enough that Seaclips cancelled all dives. This being Florida, by the time I drove back to Key West from Stock Island and walked to Mayor Fred's, the rain had let up to a drizzle, though it was still windy enough that the water was probably still a pain to dive in, especially for casual divers who were the bulk of our clientele. Two short men were holding court at the table by the ficus. They were surrounded by half a dozen people, mostly tourists I didn't recognize, but also Larry and one or two other regulars. Thor, I noticed, was nowhere to be seen. I recognized the pair instantly as the pit crew who had been standing behind Tyr at Daytona. Both of them had shaggy brown hair and noses the size of cantaloupes. The only way to tell them apart was that one had a beard and one didn't. Well, 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 I said as I walked up to them, if it isn't the sons of Ivaldi. The two dwarves looked up and laughed heartily. The one with the beard said, At last, it's Kastor Zukov of the Deesir. Larry shot me a look even as I winced. Kastor? Is that really? Yes, that's my full name. My parents named me and my twin brother, Castor and Pollux, because they're insane. And if anyone calls me Castor again, I can promise that their fate will be drastically changed. I stared at the dwarves and pointed a finger at them. That goes double for you two, Garbanzos. Both of them held up their hands. The clean-shaven one said, We vow to forget we ever knew your full name, Cassie. That's better. Please, the bearded one said, have a seat. You obviously know who we are, but not which is which. The bearded one laughed while the clean-shaven one said, I'm Itri, the good-looking one. In your dreams, brother. Broker punched Itri lightly on the arm to punctuate his point. Larry took off his raised ball cap and scratched his bald crown. These two jokers have been telling tall tales. Itri raised a bushy eyebrow. Is that meant to be a comment about our height? Psh, I said as I folded my 5'11 frame into a chair and sat opposite the brothers. You're all too short. If it is tales from tall people we will hear this night... Broker said, grabbing his pint of beer, that it should be from the oversized Dees here. Part of why we came to this island was to hear firsthand of your adventures. I used to be squirrely about talking about my being a fake goddess in front of the general public, but after what happened over Christmas, pretty much everyone in the Keys knew exactly what I was. The ones who didn't buy it just chalked it up as another crazy Key West story like all the others they didn't believe. So I told the story of how I stopped Loki from bringing about Ragnarok and how I helped Odin and Loki and Sigyn stop the spirit of the Calusa tribe from committing mass murder at the cost of Odin's own life, and the story of how a mermaid got revenge on Loki for a long-ago crime by killing him, and a bunch more stories. But I was curious about these two, and the guy they worked for. So you manage Tyr's cars? Yes, we currently dabble in vehicular modification, Itri said with a twinkle in his eye. I assume you've seen Thor's GTO? I nodded, and ridden in it. Our handiwork? Broker said proudly. That explained why the car had a mind of its own, anyhow. You made his hammer, too, right? And Sigyn's snare drum. We understand that the troop she performs with will be here this even, yes? Yeah, I said. 1812's drummer went by Ginny Blake, but her real name was Sigyn, another of the Aesir and also Loki's wife, though I guess widow was the better word now. She had a glorious brass snare drum that she guarded with her life. Now I knew why. Excellent, Broker said in reply to my positive reply. We have heard her perform in the past, but not with these particular minstrels. Can we drag it back to Thor's hammer a minute? There's something about it that's always bugged me. Well, okay, there were a lot of things about Thor in general, and the hammer in particular that bugged me, but I wasn't about to get into that. You guys made weapons for a lot of the Aesir, right? Of course, Broker said. I tree grinned. All the good ones, certainly. Nobody else that I know of among them used a hammer as a weapon. Neither did any of the Vikings. For everyone else, it's a tool. So why'd you make him a hammer? 
Broker rolled his eyes. Because the big fool couldn't hang on to any of the others. You see, Itri said, leaning forward, we kept making swords and axes and maces for Thor. And in less than a month, he would return to us with a tale of woe, that he'd lost it, or broken it, or misplaced it, or gave it to some woman he was wooing. We take great pride in our craft, Broker added, and take great care in the making, and we expect our clients to show similar care in their use. If they don't, then the care is, shall we say, reduced. Itri grinned. Which is why we simply took one of our work hammers that was lying around the forge, made it indestructible, and put enchantments on it. He can't give it away, nor can anyone else use it. I nodded. So he can't lose this one because it always flies back to his hand. The dwarves exchanged glances. Uh, well, Broker said slowly, if he gets his hand up fast enough, then yes. For a couple of seconds, I stared at them. Then I burst out laughing. The Ivaldis joined in the laughter. Either way, Itri said between guffaws, it was guaranteed to be the last weapon we'd ever have to make for him. Ginny came in then, snare drum in hand. The rest of the drum kit was already set up, and broke into a huge grin at the sight of my table. Itri, broker, I had despaired of seeing you after so many days had passed. I am afraid the post-race celebration was even heartier than usual. Itri said with a rueful grin. Indeed, Tyr is still recovering, though he claimed he would attempt to join us to see your minstrels perform this even. Ginny chuckled. We're actually referred to as a band, and I'm much happier to see the two of you in any case. Likewise, my dear, Itri said. We are especially concerned after the trickster's demise. Are you well? I wish people would stop asking me that, Ginny said a little too emphatically. Loki was a terrible person. He hasn't even been a true husband to me in far too long, and this isn't even the first time he's died on me. The rest of 1812 trickled in, and they started setting up. Larry started telling some stories of his own from his decades of sitting in this bar, and that went on until 1812's first set started. They rocked the joint, as usual. Toward the end of the set, Bobby Malewski, the lead guitarist, looked right at me and said, This is for Cassie. Then they dove into R.E.M.'s It's the End of the World as We Know It and I Feel Fine, which they've been dedicating to me on and off for months now, ever since I stopped Ragnarok in this very bar. I just rolled my eyes as the joke was starting to wear thin. On the other hand, it was a good set-ender. Just as the band started to come down off the stage, a booming voice came from the entrance by the merch table, just as a different booming voice came from the other side of the bar near the pool table. Cassie! One cried in a familiar bellow, while the other yelled, Here I am, boys and girls! in the fakest southern accent I'd ever heard. Turning, I saw Thor come in by the bar, while Jamie McIntyre walked in by the merch table. Tyr looked very out of place in his long-sleeved Daytona 500 shirt, khakis, and racing gloves. T-shirts and shorts were the usual dress on the island. It wasn't as if his fake hand would be a big deal. It wouldn't be the, even the only prosthetic in the bar, as the sound guy, Paolo, also lost his hand, but he insisted on standing out. Which, I suppose, fit his personality, both as a god and as an asshole race car driver. Thor and Tyr noticed each other, and their faces fell. They both came to the ficus and stared each other down. Brother, brother, I see you won, again. Of course I did. What all did you expect? Regardless of expectation, I was hoping for your ignominious defeat. Nah, I leave the ignominy to you. How dare you? As entertaining as this wasn't, I decided to interrupt. If you two take down your pants to compare sizes, I'm having you whore toss both of you out right now. Tyr turned away from Thor and looked at me with a spectacularly insincere grin. Well, looky here, if it ain't the deece her own self. Pleased to meet you, lovely lady. I prefer my actual name of Cassie, but whatever. Jenny came over at that point, looking nauseated. I was wondering which of you two would arrive first. Leave it to you to turn up together. Ah, fair Sigyn, Thor said. It is good to see you well after your loss. It wasn't that much of a loss, she said, sitting down next to Itri. I prefer not to speak of it. Yeah. Tyr said, pulling a chair from a nearby table. Show some respect to the lady, brother. If I do, brother, it will not be due to your desiring it. I rolled my eyes and excused myself to the bathroom. I didn't actually have to go, but there was a line, and I figured that standing on it would keep me away from the posturing for a bit. By the time I got back to the table, 1812 was setting back up for the second set. It had been a really long line, but the two brothers were still standing nose to nose. At least I didn't go and get Heimer killed on a simple little old fishing trip. And I had the brains not to place my hand in a wolf's mouth. About the only time anyone would say you'd have brains, truth to tell. Thor opened his mouth to respond, but I cut him off. Will you two shut the fuck up already? 
I looked at the dwarves. They always like this? No, usually they're contentious. I snorted, then looked back at the two gods. Now either sit down and shut up and enjoy the music, or you can both go elsewhere. Be assholes at Sloppy Joe's or Irish Kevin's. I deliberately suggested my two least favorite bars on Duval Street. They both, reluctantly, sat down, arms folded. Rolling my eyes, I sat as well. The five of us crammed around a tiny table. 1812 let off the second set with Rock Pile's Play That Fast Thing One More Time, which opened with a big, complex drum bit. That at least got Thor and Tyr to stop being all pouty, and instead got them to stare at Ginny. By the end of the song, they both had expressions on their faces that were making me nostalgic for pouty. She is a magnificent maiden, is she not? Yeah, it's a mighty fine filly. I'd rolled my eyes at these two enough times that I half expected to see the back of my head. For fuck's sake, she isn't either of those things. She's a person. Who has suffered a great loss. Not that old Loki's all that much of a loss, really. She requires the gift of comfort and pleasure. I up, and I'm just the fellow to give it to her. You do not make me laugh, Tear. You cannot bring pleasure to a concubine to whom you paid extra. Yeah, well, paying's for it. The only way you're likely to get any tail. Itri and Broker were just chortling to themselves. They were sure as shit enjoying this more than I was. Will you two shut up? All you do is bitch each other out. I mean, I get it. You're brothers, but I've got a twin brother, not to mention the brattiest little sister ever, and we're not this bad. I mean, hell, why don't you just go have a race in those surrogate penises you call cars and have done with it? Both men turned with huge grins on their faces. Now that's a mighty fine notion there. Agreed! A wager it shall be, and I shall trounce this lout with his puny vehicle. Now Itri spoke up. Hey! We put together that puny vehicle, same as we did yours. Thor put up a hand. Of course, good dwarves, your work is doubtless superb. But a steed is only as good as his rider. That last was with a scowl at his brother. I put my head in my hands. Fuck me, sideways, I've created a monster. And the winner shall have the right to woo Sigyn, Thor said while pounding his fist on the table, making everyone's drink shake and slosh onto the worn wood. Sounds pretty dang fine to me. Um, I said slowly, don't you think Ginny should have some say in this? She shall have her say when the wooing commences, Thor said. I tree grinned. So what track shall we use? Thor frowned. No, no track. That is where this varlet plies his trade. It shall be on a proper road. Kind of obvious, ain't it? Tyr said with a grin. Gotta be the Seven Mile Bridge. Indeed! Thor's face broke into a grin of its own. I put my head in my hands. The Seven Mile Bridge was part of the overseas highway that linked the keys to each other, enabling you to drive from Miami all the way down to Key West. The bridge itself linked the Seven Mile Gap between Marathon Key and Little Duck Key. You doofuses do realize there'll be other people driving on it, right? Tear chuckled. Nah, little lady, I ain't talking about the current bridge. My eyes widened. Are you kidding me? The Overseas Highway was originally the Overseas Railway. After a hurricane trashed it in the, 18, in the 1930s, the railroad sold the right-of-way to the state. Most of that old railway was now the highway, with one exception. They built a new seven-mile bridge in the 1970s, but the old one was still there. Mostly. You do know there's a big-ass gap in the old bridge, right? And it hasn't exactly been maintained as a roadway. Hell, they even banned bikes on the bridge because of the structural issues, and the bit between the gap and Little Duck is mostly old train tracks barely held together by rust. Hence the challenge, Thor bellowed. It shall be glorious. We race tonight after the tavern closes. Which was how I wound up standing next to my truck on Little Duck Key at 4.30 in the morning. Thor and Tyr were seven miles away on Marathon, but Itri had given me a set of what he called special binoculars, which enabled me to see the other end of the bridge clearly. Larry, Bobby, and Jaina were standing next to me with binoculars of their own. We were all curious about how this absurd race would go. As we were driving across the current Seven Mile Bridge toward this idiotic race's finish line, Bobby had been staring over at the darkened original bridge. What do you think the over-under is on how soon they crash into the water and drown? Jaina had snorted. We ain't got that kind of luck. I don't know, ladies, Larry had said. The pair of them were a few sheets to the wind. Now I was peering through the dwarves' binoculars. Itree was helping Thor into his goat, while Tyr was clambering into a heavily modified stock car covered in corporate logos with, excuse me, with Broker's help. You didn't usually see a stock car on a regular road, but given that the Ivaldi brothers built this, it probably wasn't your average stock car anyhow. The frame looked vaguely like a Ford, but it didn't actually match any specific car that I knew of. Thor just sat in the car, staring straight ahead while Tyr was having trouble keeping his grip on the steering wheel. I shook my head. 
Larry, those two aren't just a few sheets to the wind. More like the whole bedroom set. I looked at Bobby. I'll take the under, two minutes in. Bobby chuckled, but I was genuinely worried that the two jackasses were going to drown themselves. Peering back through the binoculars, I saw that Itri and Broker were standing between the cars with their hands up. Both cars were revving, but it was too far away for me to hear how the engine sounded. Of course, they were probably both purring. I'd never heard a hiccup from Thor's goat, and Tyr's stock car just won the biggest race in NASCAR. The dwarves lowered their arms, and the cars took off. It was pretty hard to follow them from this far away, but as they got closer, it got easier. The stock car and the goat went neck and neck, neither one taking the lead for more than a second or two before the other one overtook. I took a look at the drivers. Tyr was grinning and looking like he was enjoying himself, while Thor was grinding his teeth and looked all determined. I could see sparks fly as the cars rubbed up against the guardrail, which was made from the old railroad tracks. Peering through her own binoculars, Bobby said, Neither one of those idiots is wearing a helmet. Of course they aren't, I muttered. I don't think their heads could get any more damaged anyhow, Jana said with a snort. I couldn't argue that particular point. They were getting to the moment of truth. The gap near Pigeon Key, which was originally a swing span to allow boat traffic across, but which was removed after the new bridge was built. They had to be getting close to 200 miles an hour, and I just hoped it was enough to clear the gap. Mostly because if it wasn't, I sure as shit wasn't diving after them. When I was a kid, I never un used to understand why they would show big moments on TV shows and in movies in slow motion. It wasn't like time really slowed down, so why do that? Just let it play out in real time. But time can be damned subjective. And as soon as the two cars hit the end of the road and flew into the air over the Moser Channel, time did seem to slow down. It was like I was watching a Dukes of Hazard rerun with the General Lee flying through the air in slow-mo, except it was two cars, and the drivers were even bigger dumbasses than the Duke boys. They flew in a big arc through the air. We weren't close enough to hear anything, but I could tell looking that both gods were shouting at the top of their lungs. Tear landed first, the stock car bouncing on the rusty railroad tracks covered in wild overgrowth. Thor landed second, but only with the front wheels on the road, the back half of the goat dangling off the edge. I winced. The 64 GTO had rear-wheel drive. I waited for Thor and his car to tumble into the ocean, which was only going to be a shame insofar as it was a really nice car. But then the front wheels spun madly, and the car took off onto the tracks. Son of a bitch. Tyr was driving more cautiously on this stretch, as it was far more treacherous than the glorified bike path of the previous leg of the race. This had no paving, no solid surface, and an infrastructure that looked like it would fall into the water at any second. In fact, I could see bits of the bridge flying off it. Thor, though, was flooring it. The goat caught up to the stock car in short order, and by the time I didn't need the binoculars anymore because they were in plain sight, Thor had a length and a half on his brother. Tyr put on a burst of speed at the end, but there was no doubt at the finish line. Thor was the winner. The goat screeched to a halt on the dirt and grass, tires spinning, dirt flying, the car doing a full 180. Thor leapt out of the car before it finished spinning, crying, Ha ha! Again the Thunderer is victorious! The stock car decelerated less spectacularly. Tyr got out, looking all kinds of pouty. Nicely done there, brother, though I bet your undercarriage is all messed up. Of what concern is that? I have won! The details are of no consequence! Thor has beaten his brother. Let those varlets claim that Tyr is stronger and smarter and faster and braver. They're all fools! I turned to Bobby, and here I was worried he was going to gloat. Thor walked up to Jaina and wrapped one massive hand around her. Ah, Jaina! My sweet, lovely minstrel, come away with me and let us once again celebrate as only a god can. Somehow, Jaina managed to extricate herself. She'd already gone to bed with Thor once, and that experience was disappointing enough to convince her never to bother again. Sorry, Chuckles. Got an early morning tomorrow. Luckily, Thor wasn't bright enough to figure out that, if that was true, she wouldn't have stayed up late to watch the race. Barbara Ann! Thor cried to Bobby, undeterred. Since Bobby was asexual, this was a lost cause. My answer hasn't changed since the last forty times, Thor. Magnificent Dees! I just glared at him. Eh, pity. And the taverns are all closed, thus depriving me of further options for celebrations. But on the morrow, the drinks in Mayor Fred's saloon shall all be raised in honor of Thor. Thor the Thunderer! Thor Odinson! Thor the Loudmouth, Thor the Braying Jackass, I added. 
Laughing, he replied, Oh, no, superlative Dees, your shrewishness shall not spoil my victory. You don't mind if my shrewishness keeps trying, do you? Tyr walked up to Thor and put a hand out. Good race there, bro. Looks like you won fair and square. I accept your craven acknowledgement of my superiority, brother, and will allow you to buy the first round tomorrow night. The next night could charitably be called insane. Friday nights were crazy at the best of times, and we had the post-Daytona crowd and the pre-Bike Week crowd in addition to the usual tourists. When I got to Mayor Fred's after my evening dive, Thor was, of course, the center of attention, and he made sure there was no danger of that changing anytime soon. 1812 was between sets, and he was standing at the front of the bar, braying and laughing and hitting on every woman in the room. I saw Itri amidst the crowd of cheering patrons, and Broker was probably in there somewhere, too. Larry was in his usual spot at the bar, laughing along with everyone else. Tyr sat at the back corner of the bar near the pool table. Not really wanting a piece of Thor's insanity, I sought out the loser, who was nursing a bourbon. Without preamble, I sat next to him and said, So I thought the whole point of the exercise was to get to ask Ginny out, yet... There he is, hitting on every other woman in the bar. Ah, you missed it before, little lady. Thor went to court and soon Sigan showed her pretty face, and she turned him down faster than snot. And I bet plenty of snot was involved. Tear laughed. Yeah, probably. That's all right. The big fella done earned it. No, he didn't. I signaled Ehor and ordered a beer. Once he went off to pour my pint, Tyr said, Now look, little lady, I know you ain't all that fond of my brother, but he did win the race. I'm not saying you didn't earn it because I don't like him. I'm saying you didn't earn it because you let him win. Tyr shot me a look. Excuse me? Oh, don't give me that innocent look. You suck at it worse than you suck at that southern accent. Besides, I'm a fake goddess, remember? I can see shit most people can't. On the last leg, you went all cautious on the tracks. Them tracks was dangerous. Could have ripped the heck out of my undercarriage, like I said afterward. And what's wrong with my accent? Please, I've seen what I tree and Broker did for Thor's goat. Ehor handed me my pint and I gulped down a bit. For starters, they gave it front-wheel drive, probably precisely to avoid what would have happened last night if he had only rear wheel. Plus, the car's smart. Hell, it's probably smarter than he is. I chuckled. Well, okay, my beer is probably smarter than he is. And that's just a car they threw together for somebody they don't even like. You expect me to believe that your pit crew wouldn't magic up your stock car as much as they could? Your undercarriage would have been fine. And if it wasn't, they'd have fixed it up in time for Avondale. Yeah, we gotta hit the road for Arizona tomorrow. He shook his head. Look, times have changed. Don't nobody worship us no more. Hell, if it wasn't for the comic books and the movies, we'd probably have no power left at all. But those of us who did survive, we got stuff to keep us going. I got my racing. Itri and Broker got their tinkering and building. Siggins got her band. I hear tell Odin took up scuba diving. I nodded. The Allfather had actually been an excellent diver. Tyr took a sip of his bourbon. As for Loki, he was always scheming, but Thor? He shook his head. He ain't got much going. He's just... Well, he's just Thor, you know? A thousand years ago, he was stumbling around, drinking, being an idiot, and sleeping with any girl that'd have him. And here it is, a thousand years later. He's still drinking, still stumbling around, being an idiot, still sleeping with any girl that'd have him. We all found us a life. He didn't. He let out a long breath. He's my brother. Hell, I'm his big brother. I've been around a lot longer than he has. And I've seen stuff that has turned his beard white. Especially with the Allfather not around no more, I gotta look out for him. So yeah, I let him win the race. I figured he deserved to have something. He frowned at me. You ain't gonna tell him, are you, little lady? That depends. Can you, for fuck's sake, not call me little lady? Seriously, what is it with you guys and your stupid nicknames? My name is Cassie. It's just two syllables. Tear threw his head back and laughed. I noticed a complete lack of drawl in the laugh. Then he held up his glass. You got yourself a deal, Cassie, to Thor's victory. I held up my pint to being a good brother. We clinked our glasses and each took a sip. A crashing sound came from the front of the bar. I looked over to see that Thor had fallen over and a crowd was gathered around him. With a sideways glance at Tear, I asked, I don't suppose you could take him with you to Arizona. I ain't that good a brother. Too bad. I got up and headed to the front of the bar, pushing my way through the tourists who were gawking at the drunken lout who'd gone from life of the party to rug. Okay, folks. Nothing to see here. Come on, Thor. Upsy-daisy. Thor didn't budge. The bar was too crowded to try to carry him out, so we just left him. 
For the rest of the night, people danced around him, drank around him, tripped over him, and generally had a great time while he snored on the floor of Mayor Fred's saloon. It was a fantastic party in his, in his honor. Probably the best party he never saw. Well, okay, except for that one time... Well, that's another story. That was Seven Mile Race. There were references in there to other stories of Cassie Zukov. Um, Cassie saved the world from Loki starting Ragnarok in the story Ragnarok and Roll, which first appeared in Tales from the House Band Volume 1, uh, later reprinted in both Apocalypse 13 and in the, short, the Cassie short story collection Ragnarok and Roll, uh, Tales of Cassie Zukov Weirdness Magnet, uh, which is available from Plus One Press. Um... The story of Odin's uh, death stopping a uh, ghost from being out of control was also in Ragnarok and Roll in a story called Cayo Hueso, which was a three-part uh, novella that was uh, actually originally printed as three e-books um, and also put in Ragnarok and Roll. And uh, Loki uh, being killed by a mermaid taking revenge on him for a long-ago prank was in a story called Fish Out of Water, which appeared in Out of Tune, which is available from Journalstone Press. Um, and there's also the story of what happened over Christmas, which I haven't told yet. That's one of the many Cassie Zukov stories still yet to be told, although I do intend to tell it. Um, in addition, there will be uh, a follow-up to this of sorts, another story involving Tyr called Behind the Wheel, which will be appearing in uh, TV God's summer programming, which should be out uh, in the fall of this year, if all goes well. Um, anyhow, back in 2004, I was invited to participate in an anthology called 44 Clowns, 11 Stories of the Four Clowns of the Apocalypse. The brainchild of the twisted genius Jay Lake, the anthology was assembled with my story being one of the 11 that would have been in it. Unfortunately, for a variety of tiresome reasons, the anthology never actually got published. Doubly unfortunately, as you're about to see when I read it, the story I wrote really could only go in an anthology about the four clowns of the apocalypse. Well, there, or in a collection of my own short fiction, so here we are. While Jay died of cancer, unfortunately, in 2014, he did live long enough for me to announce the table of contents of this of Without a License, and he was very happy to see that this story found a home at last. So without further ado, here is Behold a White Tricycle, which finally saw the light of day in Without a License. And I saw when the ringmaster opened one of the tent flaps, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four clowns saying, Hiya, hiya, hiya! And I saw, and behold, a white tricycle, and he that sat in it had a tootie horn, and a red nose was given unto him, and he went forth laughing, and to induce laughter. And when he had opened the second tent flap, I heard the second clown say, Voody! And there went out another tricycle that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to give candy to the children, and that they should hit one another over the head with rubber mallets. And there was given unto him a seltzer bottle. And when he had opened the third tent flap, I heard the clown say, ha cha cha cha, -cha. And I beheld, and lo, a black tricycle, and he that sat on it had a pair of rubber balls in his hand. And I heard the voice in the midst of the four clowns say, A pie in the face for a penny, and three pies in the face for a half dollar, and get sprayed with this big bottle of seltzer! And when he had opened the fourth tent flap, I heard the voice of the fourth clown say, What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? And I looked, and behold, a pale tricycle, and his name that sat on him was Bozo, and tigers followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the circus grounds, to tickle with feathers, and with hunger for cotton candy, and with kids dying laughing, while watching the beasts of the earth tramp about. And when he had opened the fifth tent flap, I saw under the big top the souls of them that died laughing, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou now let these clowns hurry up and stop acting like idiots so he doesn't see the cool stuff like the trapeze artists? And grease paint was given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their acrobats also and their jugglers, that should be as silly as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth tent flap, and lo, there was a great earthquake, 
and the tent became black as sackcloth of hair as the lights went out, and the tent then became as blood as the red lights went up. And the stars of the circus fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the circus departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every tent and stand were moved out of their places. And the ringmaster, and the great jugglers, and the rich backers, and the chief owners, and the mighty weightlifters, and every roustabout and every clown, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of them that want us to perform six shows a day, and from the wrath of the bosses that write our checks. For the great day of the circus is come, and who shall be able to juggle? Without a License is available from Dark Quest Books via all the usual online retailers. Also out now are the three Super City Cops novellas, Avenging Amethyst, Undercover Blues, and Secret Identities, which I talked about in last month's Dead Kitchen Radio. Uh, the first two books in the Tales of Asgard trilogy, Marvel's Thor, Duel Dueling with Giants, and Marvel's Sif, Even Dragons Have Their Endings, with the third book, Marvel's Warriors 3, Godhood's End, due in the spring. Also available is my Stargate SG-1 novel, Kali's Wrath. I have stories in several anthologies, including more Super City Cop stories in With Great Power and The Light of Good, The Side of Evil, as well as um, more Cass another Cassie Zukov story in A Baker's Dozen of Magic, and stories in The X-Files, Trust No One, Limbus Inc. Book 3, Stargate SG-1 slash Atlantis Far Horizons, V-Wars and V-Wars Night Terrors, and Altered States of the Union. Uh, which, like the Cassie Zukov stories, uh, takes place in Key West, although it is not a Cassie story as such. Um, I've also got a story in the upcoming Baker Street Irregulars anthology, which is um, a collection of alternate Sherlock Holmes stories. I'll be talking about that one next month. If you want to see me in public, you can find me at uh, the following conventions. From the 17th to the 19th of February, that's President's Day weekend, I will be at Farpoint 2017 in Timonium, Maryland. Um, find out more at farpointcon.com. Uh, i got three straight weekends in March where I'll be at conventions. Uh, from the 10th to the 12th, I will be at Heliosphere in Tarrytown, New York. Go to heliospherenny.org for more information. The following weekend, I'll be out in Brentwood, New York for Icon 32. This is the uh, revival of, of Icon after a, a lengthy hiatus that was uh, unfortunately uh, uh, necessitated by Superstorm Sandy a few years ago that uh, fairly messed up Long Island and, and several of the college campuses where ICON used to hold their home uh, convention in years past. But uh, they'll be back this year, finally. Um, and I'll be one of the author guests from the 17th to 19th of March. And then the following weekend, the 24th, 25th, and 26th of March, I will be at Regeneration Who 3, a, the East Coast's largest Doctor Who convention, which is be held in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, for Icon, go to iconsf.org. For Regen, go to Regeneration Who, all one word, dot com. Uh, first weekend in April, I will be at Lunacon 2017, uh, which also will be in Tarrytown, New York. Uh, go to lunacon.org for more information. That's from the 7th to the 9th of April, and I'll be there uh, possibly as an author guest, but certainly as a member of the Boogie Nights, who are the musical guests at the convention that year. Uh, at the end of April, I'll be one of the guests at ZenKaiCon 2017 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Go to ZenKaiCon, that's Z-E-N-K-A-I-K-O-N.com. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, I'll be at Balticon in Baltimore. And in over Fourth of July weekend, I will be in Indianapolis for In Conjunction, where I will be the Toastmaster. Uh, so that's where you can find me, and there may be other stuff coming as we go along. Uh, Dead Kitchen Radio is a monthly podcast discussing all things cred. You can find us on the web at deadkitchenradio.wordpress.com, which will include show notes on uh, this episode as well as all the others. And you can like Dead Kitchen Radio on Facebook as well. Just search for Dead Kitchen Radio, you'll find it. Uh, comments can be left at the aforementioned WordPress site, uh, deadkitchenradio.wordpress.com. Also on the aforementioned Facebook page, you can also send me email at keith at decandido.net. You can also comment at my blog or Facebook page. Uh, gateways to those places are at decandido.net. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Cradic and on Instagram at crad418. Dead Kitchen Radio was recorded by Keith R.A. DeCandido, produced and edited by John S. Drew, with music by Stephen Rosenhaus. Dead Kitchen Radio is part of the Chronic Rift Network. For more information about the network, go to chronicrift.com. Until next time, this is Keith DeCandido saying, this is Keith DeCandido saying, good night. Now what goes will come around again, and forgive my being crass, but you know those boots of karma will just kick them in the ass, so just relax. Sit down and 
Have another drink on me And have another drink on me